Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here, and I'm sure that I, you all are um, excited to get out to enjoy the beautiful day later, so we'll keep moving forward. I'm going to focus especially on diffuse large B cell lymphoma and who should receive treatment beyond RCHOP. Here are my disclosures. Um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, 30 to 40 percent of cases. Um, more than half of patients are greater than uh, 60 years. Uh, the majority of them have advanced stage disease. About two-thirds are cured with frontline therapy, and most patients are treated with RCHOP times six cycles. The patients who are refractory uh, to second-line therapy have an extremely poor prognosis uh, with an overall survival of about four months. So it's important that we really do our best to cure patients up front. And that's why I want to focus on which patients should be treated with treatment uh, other than RCHOP or more than RCHOP. Who should be treated differently includes double and triple hit lymphomas, primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma, HIV associated DLBCL, uh, patients with CNS involvement or high risk sites for CNS relapse, and then limited stage DLBCL. This uh, slide is courtesy of Dr. Leonard. Um, this is data that was presented by um, Dr. Bartlett at ASH in 2016, the Alliance um, 503 to study of RCHOP versus dose-adjusted EPOC-R in newly diagnosed diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients. And you can see that the C C CR rates and the event-free survival and overall survival were all just about the same without any um, statistically significant difference. Uh, however, there are certain patients that we do uh, still use dose-adjusted EPOC-R uh, for, and uh, I'll go forward with that data now. Double and triple hit lymphomas um, are a new category that was introduced in the uh, WHO classification of lymphoid neoplasms in 2016. Um, you can see um, there was a new category called high-grade B-cell lymphomas with MYC, BCL2, and or BCL6 translocations. Uh, and then just going up at the, to, to the top of the slide, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was also broken down into the mole molecular subtypes of activated B-cell type and germinal center type. Uh, the co-expression of MYC and BCL2 uh, was added as a, uh, a new prognostic marker of poor prognosis, but it was not actually given a separate category. And then the high-grade B-cell lymphoma in NOS is the last category. Double and triple hit lymphomas are characterized by chromosomal translocations that involve MYC, BCL2, and or BCL6 genes. The majority of double hit lymphomas are BCL2 and MYC rearranged. That's about 60 to 80 percent of cases, and a smaller percentage are MYC and BCL6 rearranged. And the remaining uh, are rearranged in all three. Those are triple hit lymphomas. These are all characterized by refractoriness to chemotherapy. The overall survival is 5 to 24 months when they are treated with RCHOP. Extranodal involvement, including CNS, uh, involvement is more common than in a non-double hit and triple hit. And the incidence is estimated at, at about 5 to 10 percent uh, for double hit lymphoma cases and 1 percent for triple hit of the, of the bigger category diffuse or diffuse cell lymphoma patients. I want to mention double protein expressor uh, lymphomas. I do want to say that the RCHOP times 6 is still the standard for these patients. They have increased expression of MYC and BCL2 by immunohistochemistry uh, in the absence of gene rearrangements. And the pathologists will usually report this as positive or negative, but the cutoffs that they typically use are 40% for MYC and 50% for BCL2. These are more common than double hit cases and maybe up to a third based on a study of about 500 patients. And as I mentioned on the prior slide, it's an indicator of less favorable prognosis um, than standard DLBCL, but RCHOP does remain the standard treatment for that disease. This is a slide that shows the data that we have to, to use to guide us uh, with using dose-adjusted EPOC-R and double and triple hit lymphomas. It is uh, accepted as the standard for these patients, though op uh, outcomes do remain suboptimal. The top part of the slide is, these are both retrospective data sets. The top is, a num is from a, a review by Adam Petrich, which in, with a number of different sites included of about 300 patients um, with various regimens, RCHOP, hypercevad, 
our EPOC codex M IVAC, and you see that in the middle bar is the patients that are treated with dose adjusted EPOC R having a better response rate. And then a progression free survival pictured of our CHOP here uh, versus all of the other regimens ha had an improvement in progression free survival. Fortunately, the patients still didn't do very well uh, compared to non double hit patients um, with a median progression free survival of about 11 months and overall sur survival of 22 months. The bottom um, part shows data from the MD Anderson group of about 130 patients looking at our CHOP. Uh, dose adjusted EPOC R and a regimen that included hypercevat and some high dose methotrexate. The uh, CR rate, the event free survival, and overall survival were, were all better with dose adjusted EPOC R compared to the other regimens. The role and timing of stem cell transplant in this disease is not clear. The two uh, data sets that I showed on the prior slide, this is the Petrich and this is the uh, MD Anderson uh, data sets showing, in this case, a trend towards uh, uh, improvement in overall survival. Uh, these are all overall survival curves pictured here, um, but not statistically significant. And then uh, no, no statistical significant uh, improvement in overall survival. Um, and, and these were primarily autologous stem cell transplants. The bottom uh, graph shows data from a group of, of studies, uh, a group of sites that looked retrospectively at patients who got uh, stem cell transplants in CR2. And you can see here that uh, these are the non-double hit patients and then versus the double hit patients. So the double hit patients were still do doing poorly um, in spite of the transplant. Uh, this is an indication that novel strategies really need to be used in this patient population. Uh, we've been studying at Cordell and at a number of, of other sites um, along with uh, some of the investigators here, the combination of venetoclax with dose-adjusted EPOC-R and newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients and are very excited about that combination. I will now move on to primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. This is uh, a disease that represents 2 to 4 percent of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It primarily occurs in adolescents and young adults. It's uh, typically limited stage with bulky mediastinal lymphadenopathy. It arises from thymic B cells. Uh, it has expression of CD19, 20, 22, 23, and uh, sometimes weak CD30 expression. And it also has overexpression of PD1, um, which has prompted some investigation into checkpoint inhibitors in this disease. Uh, primary mediastinal B cell lymphomas has been treated with dose adjusted EPOC R initially at a study. Uh, at the NCI uh, with a data set at Stanford as well. And uh, one of the goals of this regimen was to take away radiation. Uh, these are young patients we'd rather not expose to radiation. And so you can see the excellent yeah, event-free survival and overall survival. The top uh, curves are from the NCI and then the bottom um, from the uh, Stanford group. There are about 50 patients with uh, event-free survival of 93% and uh, and uh, overall survival of 97% with a median follow-up of five years. I now want to show some data from Lisa Roth, who had worked together with 24 academic centers. Um, she uh, is a pediatric uh, oncologist in our lymphoma group at Cornell, and so she looked at children and adults, three, 38 children, 118 uh, adults, and you can see that the outcomes were still very good, not quite as good as the prior slide that I showed. Um, but this is retrospective data in, in a number of different sites, um, but still quite good uh, event-free survival and um, overall survival in these patients treated with those suggested epoch R. And uh, it is known that the pediatric patients tend to not do as well, which is what has been seen in her study. Uh, another point to make is that post-treatment PET scans uh, are predictive of event-free survival and overall survival in patients with this disease treated with those adjusted EPOC R. Um, Doville scores are pictured um, from one down to five here, and so patients with the, the higher Doville scores had worse event-free survival and overall survival. I do want to note in this disease, it, it's often very important to, to talk to directly to your radiologist. Uh, even though it seems like it should be very objective that Doville scores are three, four, et cetera, often patients with this disease will have SUVs that are mildly above the liver in the mediastinum. Often it could just be a rim, and it may be read by the radiologist as a Doville four, but really if you talk about the, the case with them, you might find out that actually really may be a Doville three. This type of patient can be followed with another scan in two or three months, and frequently the uh, SUVs will resolve down to normal. 
I wanted to show this one other retrospective study that was just published in um, BGH in 2018 um, that looked at patients treated at 100, uh, excuse me, 11 sites and uh, included 130 patients uh, looking at people who had been treated with our EPOC or our CHOP. Uh, of note in this, um, <clears throat> some patients in the our EPOC arm did get uh, radiation. So, uh, we, it is somewhat limited what we can assess from this data set, but it does show a trend towards overall survival with um, dose adjusted EPOC R versus over R CHOP and, and also a progression free survival benefit as well. I will now move on to HIV associated DLBCL. There are two major types of diffuse large B cell lymphoma in HIV patients, um, centroblastic and immunoblastic. The centroblastic are germinal center type and um, tend to have um, just, uh, they, they tend to be healthier people with mild uh, immunodeficiencies, better, higher CD4 counts, um, better prognosis overall for the reasons that, part of the reasons I've said, and then they tend to be patients who are already on antiretrovirals, and this is uh, opposed to the post-germinal center or immunoblastic variants of patients that tend to have uh, present presentations in a state of severe immunodeficiency, lower CD4 counts, and often on, are not on card, uh, are, on antiretrovirals. There, is n there are not a lot of studies in this patient population. I'm going to go over two studies. Um, the first was actually retrospective analysis of two trials in HIV-positive uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. lymphoma. The, most of the patients have diffuse large B cell lymphoma. One studied RCHOP and one studied dose-adjusted EPOC-R. Um, the data on the left is to show that the groups are very well matched. And uh, on the right, the dose-adjusted EPOC-R is the top curve on every single one of these, so event-free survival of all comers of low-risk and uh, uh, high-risk IPIs are all, all of the patients are um, doing better with um, dose-adjusted EPOC-R versus RCHOP. Again, this was a retrospective analysis, but it's, it's some of the only data that we have with this disease in, uh, in these chemotherapy regimens. This is a study that was published by Kieran Dunleavy back in 2010. I actually touched base with him the other day to see if he's still using this regimen, and he is. Um, it's a short course of EPOC with two doses of rituximab with each cycle, and there is no dose adjustment as there would be in other uh, in a standard uh, dose adjusted EPOC R. Uh, it does suspend the antiretroviral therapies. So, uh, in in the past. Uh, older uh, antiretrovirals, were con there is a concern about interactions of those drugs with the chemotherapy drugs, which may make the chemotherapy less effective. With more modern antiretrovirals, this is less of a concern, and we typically don't hold the antiretrovirals in our patients at Cornell, uh, but I did, in this study, it was held, the patients, there were about 30 patients, they got two cycles of EPOC-RR, and if they had a negative PET scan, they then went on to just receive one more uh, uh, cycle. And that actually included majority of patients. About 80% of patients only received three cycles. They had very good responses. Um, pa patients with pe positive PET scans either went on to different therapy or received additional uh, RR EPOC um, based on the investigator's discretion. And um, this uh, shows the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival curves. The progression-free survival was 84% and 68% for the overall survival with a median follow-up of five years. Germinal center versus non-germinal center is pictured here, and I did tell you a couple slides back that these patients with the germinal center type, particularly in HIV, uh, do uh, much better than the non-germinal type. Um, e EBV negative um, disease did better than EBV positive, not surprisingly, and then patients with a CD4 count greater than 100 um, did better than patients with CD4 less than 100, which all of which we would expect. I will now shift on to patients with CNS involvement or high-risk sites for CNS relapse. The incidence of CNS relapse is about 5% in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It is, um, can either be isolated to the CNS or it can be in association with systemic disease. The timing is usually two years, uh, within two years from the, the initial diagnosis. Median survival is very poor, four months if this occurs, so we really want to try to prevent it if we can. The CNS IPI is an important score um, showing um, kidney and adrenal involvement. This is an order, actually, of, of how 
um, it, how much it, uh, these different factors are uh, causing risk. So um, kidney and adrenal in uh, involvement is the most uh, risk factor, um, great, age greater than 60, elevated LDH, ECOG, performance status greater than one, stage three to four, and then greater than one um, extranodal site. I do want to make a note for one of your questions. I had sent a, an updated version that didn't make it into the slides. Um, with a, a patient that had the paraspinal mass, so just for your um, reference when you see this slide later, um, picture that as a, actually as a 60-year-old six, patient who has an elevated LDH and had um, two extranodal sites and stage three to four disease, and he has a very high uh, risk for CNS recurrence based on those um, information. Um, other high-risk sites include um, testes, breast, paranasal sinuses, paraspinal uh, disease, and uh, bone marrow. This is data from a retrospective review done by Jeremy Abramson um, with MRCHOP um, in DLBCL with high-risk sites for CNS relapse. This uh, regimen gives RCHOP every 21 days with peg filgrastum support, which is very important in this regimen. Uh, and then high-dose methotrexate of 3.5 grams per meter squared given on day 15. Uh, the, this uh, review included 65 patients with DLBCL in the sites that are listed here. Uh, median KI67 was high at 68%. Uh, there were two double hit patients, although only about a half of the patients had cytogenetic information available. MR CHOP clearly decreased the risk of CNS relapse in this study. Uh, the median cycles of high-dose methotrexate were three with a range of one to eight. Um, so we often try to do three to four cycles um, in these patients when we're concerned about the risk of, uh, of relapse uh, based on this data. Um, the complete response rate was 80, uh, eight, 86 percent. There were two CNS relapses, which is much lower than would have been expected in this high-risk population. One of them had a relapse just about a month after completing therapy, which uh, makes one concerned that, uh, that they they may have had the CNS involvement from the beginning, um, and uh, another one was a bit later, but still within uh, half a year. Um, toxicity, as you would imagine, renal um, was the most common. One patient did require temporary hemodialysis, but then did recover their renal function, mucositis, and cytopenias, and there were some delays uh, in RCHOP. This is a trial that I just wanted to briefly mention uh, in testicular DLBCL. This technically was a limited stage study. Testicular DLBCL is a particularly high risk site for CNS relapse and often is actually diagnosed concomitantly with uh, baseline with CNS involvement. Um, and this, this study shows uh, uh, stage one and stage two patients that were treated with RCHOP and if they went into CR, they ultimately received six cycles of RCHOP followed by a contralateral testicular um, irradiation, and then they also got intrathecal methotrexate uh, four doses. And those who had a PR got a total of eight cycles of RCHOP. Um, I do want to mention that in in certainly in older patients who you don't think can tolerate high-dose methotrexate, intrathecal methotrexate can be a, a good option, as you can see, in, and I'll go over the data in the subsequent slide, but we really prefer to give high-dose methotrexate, uh, which we think penetrates the CNS much better if it can be tolerated by patients. Uh, this study showed that the PFS and CNS relapse were improved when, um, in, when intrathecal methotrexate and, and radiation were given compared to historical data. The historical data, data for testicular DLBCL is that the median overall survival is four to five years and that they have a continuous <coughs> risk of relapse even 10 years after diagnosis, which is different than uh, the majority of DLBCL patients. The risk of relapse at five and 10 years is 20 and 35 percent based on historical data. And then on this study, the, the patients, um, at five years, the progression-free survival was 74 percent and overall survival 85 percent. There were 10 relapses, only three of which were in the CNS in a, in a high-risk population, and a 6 percent cumulative uh, incidence of CNS relapse, which is certainly lower than what would have been expected. I will conclude with a discussion of limited-stage DLBCL. Limited stage is about a third of cases, and uh, the majority of them are germinal center subtype, which was reported in a study that, that was presented at ASH, uh, which I'll go over in just a minute. Um, they have improved overall survival compared to advanced stage. Um, there is a stage modified IPI, and those with zero score on that have an overall survival at five years, 95 to 98 percent. Just like I mentioned on the last slide with testicular DLBCL, in the, um, which is often localized, uh, late relapses are more common than in advanced stage. 
The most standard treatment is based on two SWOG studies among some other studies, but the, these are the, the two big ones. Um, that the first, this is basically just showing the RCHOP uh, times three cycles plus involved field radiation, uh, and, it, and it also shows the CHOP times three cycles with involved field radiation. You can see um, that you know that these patients have done very well with the, with this regimen. Um, of note, they did include bulky stage one, which is in contrast to the next study that I'll mention. Uh, there. Uh, there is a shift in the paradigm of RCHOP times three plus radiation, so this is something definitely to, to watch. Um, I want to go over two studies that were presented at ASH uh, this, this past December. First was a LISA study um, that that was uh, patients were actually treated with RCHOP 14 uh, every two weeks instead of every three weeks. The study had started um, back in the early 2000s. Those who had a, a negative PET scan um, were randomized to either getting so ultimately, it, they, they based it off of their SMIPI score. So if patients had zero SMIPI score, they would get either um, observation, um, after, so that's after four cycles of RCHOP versus uh, 40 grade of radiation. Uh, there was an argument uh, by um, Dr. Persky, who wrote a commentary in, in the blood um, journal when this came out in January, um, saying that they really had better, healthier patients uh, that had better, better um, IPI scores on the study. So that is something to take into consideration. Um, but there was no overall survival difference. There was a trend toward a slight trend toward relapse, um, greater relapse in the patients who didn't get radiation. This is something to continue to follow. The other study, um, early data published uh, or presented at ASH, a SWOG study that uh, that had RCHOP times three cycles and then a PET scan. If the PET scan was negative, they would get one additional cycle of RCHOP, so a total of four. Um, there was actually a CR in 116 out of 130 patients. If it was positive, they would get involved field radiation plus Zevalin. Um, and there were a number of patients that converted into a CR, but again, very small number that even uh, didn't get a CR in that, in that study. In summary, um, double and triple hit lymphoma should be treated with those suggested epoch R times six or an investigational regimen, um, preferably. Um, primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma also treated with those suggested epoch R times six. HIV associated DLBCL, um, we frequently give a dose adjusted EPOC R times six, but I did show you the, the data um, from Kieran Dunleavy on um, the short course EPOC RR, which would be acceptable. Uh, for CNS involvement or high risk sites of relapse, MR CHOP should be done. And uh, if, it, if the patients are having a difficult time tolerating the methotrexate, it can be given at the end. Um, I did want to note also with um, regard to patients who um, have high risk sites for CNS involvement but need to get um, dose adjusted EPOC R for the other reasons mentioned, um, should get a prophylactic intrathecal methotrexate along with their R EPOC. And then if you think that they need to get additional uh, treatment that you would want to wait until after the EPOC is completed to do high-dose methotrexate, uh, the, the regimens combined are, are quite toxic. Uh, and then finally, the limited stage DLBCL, the, the, the standard is RCHOP times three followed by radiation. Um, but certainly if you have patients that you're concerned about getting radiation, for example, a uh, high risk of or family history of breast cancer, if there's some other factor that makes you concerned about giving radiation, you can consider um, RCHOP uh, times four if there's a CR on interim PET and certainly want to follow that, those studies that have been presented as the data continues to mature.